Welcome to the Scuttlebutt Podcast. I'm Rich Mellon, and today we are in a very different place for a trapper. We are in downtown Toronto. My guest is Bill Davies. Bill, welcome. Hi. And it's a pleasure. I, I, what does Toronto have to do with trappers? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, other than fostering a few of us, um, <laughs> there's a lot of raccoon down here, but I'm myself, I was born and raised in Toronto, but I don't live near Toronto. So okay. <laughs> I couldn't get further west without becoming an American, so, <laughs> in, oh, Ontario, okay. in, in Ontario, so that's okay. what, that's where I live now, and that's where I do most of my trapping. I have a trap line in what would call, uh, from here would be called northern Ontario, but it's really central Ontario. Okay, yeah, I, n- I noticed that it's kind of funny when people talk about northern Ontario, and I, I go, out, I look on the map, and I, they're still south of Calgary. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, being in Toronto, I, uh, born in Toronto, I... I always thought Bracebridge was going north, which probably doesn't mean a lot to you. No, I'm... But that's two hours north of Toronto until I started uh, doing the Ontario fur managers um, for a few years. And then I found that most of Ontario was north of Toronto. And the guys in North Bay or in in Thunder Bay would call North Bay, we're going south. Okay. (laughs) So, so, yeah, Ontario's pretty big. Okay, so... Take me, how did you start in, like, were you yeah. were you born into the life of trapping? Well, well, I wasn't born into the life of trapping. In fact, uh, I was born more into the life of the outdoors, uh, hunting and fishing. Um, being in Toronto, I was very anti-trapping when I was a teenager. Really? Um, even when I hunted, like, we were always taught to kill, Um very humanely, right? And yep. when we first went on uh, uh, out hunting and we'd see traps, um, I now have a trap supply business, but <laughs> <laughs> I probably shot more traps than I've ever owned. Okay. Because what we saw on TV from the anti-fur movement, um, there was no other voice out there, if you know what I mean. Like, yep. the, the, the trappers weren't out there, so... Oh, no, no, we, I know. We, but you got to understand, back in those days, you had to have money to have media. Well, e- even at that, my, as soon as I got my trapper's license, the first time I was ever at an Ontario Trappers Association event, okay, which was the first year, I stood up at a meeting and I said, you know, <clears throat> the anti-trapping guys in Toronto are winning. They're doing their job. We need to, as trappers, uh, get out there and give give our our side of things and an old gentleman by the name of lloyd cook um he's, he's a very nice guy but he stood up and he says son i know you have good intentions but these anti-trappers are going to go away if we just ignore them and i said no i think you're you're sadly mistaken oh uh, <laughs> yeah and but uh we we i mean we have we've come a long way we uh I got out into uh, out into western su- southwestern Ontario, and I'd be hunting with people who trapped, and it's, I'd say, "Yeah, you can't trap. You're ripping their legs off. You know, you're you, all this stuff that I saw on TV was true." And they, no, no, it's not. No, no, it's not. No, no, it's not. Yeah, fa- so, fake news wasn't just invented for the internet. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I think the anti-trapping movement started it, or the anti-hunting. Tra- <laughs> so when I got to see that the animal, like, you would never have been able to pay. I mean, you could have made a lot of money if you bet me that a fox would be asleep in a foothold trap. Right, right. Um, but because of my background, I've done a lot of talks with kids. Uh, I've done the... Uh, London's Children's Museum, I've done schools. What, what background? Let me, I just what, well, with, that. With my background of being hunting and fishing, anti-trapping, and then very pro-trapping. Like, I, the Ontario Fur Managers, who I'm sure you're aware of. Right. I was a founding member. I did the original. Most people would look at me as the father of the constitution of that association. And then... For a while, for about four years, I was president of the Canadian National Trappers Alliance. So from going from anti-trapping to extremely pro-trapping is what I'm talking about. Okay, so how did that happen? Well, it got out by experience. Like I said, I, my father taught me in hunting, never take a shot unless you know the animal's going to die. Yep. So we were never anti-killing. 
we were anti-cruelty. Absolutely. Okay. We all are that. Right. So when I got out, I've, I mean, like I said, the only side of the story I saw was what was portrayed on TV, right? So then some of my buddies would say, well, come on with me. If you think what you're saying is right, come with me. And here's a fox sleeping in a trap if you walk up to it. I mean, that was, yep. in my mind, unheard of, right? Right. And so I started to see things from their perspective and realize what the antis produced as trapping <laughs> was not. I know. Okay. Like, I mean, you, you see so much of it where, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the mother is laying there waiting just to get back to her cup or her kits in the, in the den and all, that, which is such pure crap yeah. because the, the kits are born in the spring. Trapping happens in the fall after, uh, after the kids are, are, are adults, you right. know, I mean, there's so much uh, emotion. They, they use a, a, any little bit yeah. of emotion that the, they can to make us, us look bad and make other people feel bad right. about what we do. So, so, uh, so from that, I didn't mind the killing of the animal. I didn't mind using the animal. Um, and it wasn't at all what I had been taught uh, for years. So when, when I would start talking with kids or adults, I'd give them my background and before I go into my, tr my explanation of trapping, I'd always say, who here sort of feels like I used to feel where trapping wasn't maybe the best thing to do? And you'd be surprised, even in the rural areas, how many hands would go up, right? Well, they still believe that the toothed leg holds and all that kind of right. stuff, right? Yeah. yeah. So then I would turn to them and say, okay, who here has talked to a trapper, been with like sort of walking them through my experience, who here's been with a trapper, talked to a trapper, been out trapping? And nobody had been much, right? So then I'd pick on one of the people who didn't raise their hand. I said, so I heard a real rotten story about you, and I believe it, and I don't like you, and I don't like what you do because of it. And they, especially as you get into the older kids, they'd say, that's not fair. <laughs> I say, you're right. Good for you. <laughs> but isn't that what you've done to me? Yeah. So I'm not asking you to believe me. I'm just asking you to give me a chance. Yeah. And I've always believed in the, uh, I, I've heard it called the 10-80-10 theory or the 20-60-20 theory. In other words, 10% of the people will always agree with you, right? 10% of the people will never agree with you, but there's that 80% in the middle. So I don't ever try and persuade uh, folks who I know are uh, you, you are the organizers uh, of it, but you that are 80%. The first admitted anti-trapper that I've ever heard that, that actually saw the light. Usually with anti-trappers, I just you know block, delete, and done. I mean, everything's done on social media <laughs> today, right? <laughs> I, I don't well, we see where this interview is <laughs> going in a hurry. <laughs> no, because, because there's, they, they don't want to uh listen to reason they don't right. want to see facts or anything it's like arguing about climate change or anything else today or carbon taxes and you know it's just you you have to go with this emotion right. and and the whole thought you know like that um there's no such thing as too little of a, of, of a thing to be important or too little a, amount to be important you when you found or saw the light that was how many years ago now <laughs> Many, <laughs> more, probably 30, I'm trying to think, 30, been married 38 years, so probably 36, 37 years. So that was even before the, the uh, new, the Ahidas uh, Agreement. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And, yeah, but, and so. before the changes to the foothold traps yeah. and... And, and I, I even got my, like, the AIDS Agreements has done us great things, yep. where... If I've been speaking to the Council of the City of Toronto, like, like I said, I was very involved in the trapping organizations. Um, and I'd go to a lot of the meetings, especially when something bad happened. And it was nice to be able to say these traps have passed international humane trapping standards, especially when you had folks like Liz White standing there from Animal Alliance. And I could say, you know, well, they're eating themselves apart. And, and like we always, like when Walt Disney, mm -hmm. the animal eats itself out of, or chews its leg off to get out of a trap. We all thought that's true. Right, okay. right. And then I went with a guy who says, no, if you use even the right size foothold, they can't get underneath. They never chew above. 
Yeah. And the proof of the pudding in that one is the DP traps we we yep. now have, right? Yep. Aku, Aku never chews himself out that's of That's a, a dog-proof trap. Yeah. And yeah. they are a, 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 an a tube. Yeah, yeah, and, and the, the coon shoves his paw in there. The reason reason for them is that is that the, the coon will shove his paw in to try and get the bait. A dog won't. So right. they call him a dog-proof trap. And, and uh, I have to explain that because we don't have coons where I come from. <laughs> Well, what a raccoon would do, because it's got such a narrow nose, okay? Yeah. And the way I explain it to people, I said, if you put an elastic around your finger, does it hurt? No. No. What, le- what happens to your finger if you leave that elastic around there for 10 minutes? Well, it, we, it just goes, did, we just did that with my daughter's uh, ca- calves uh, on their farm. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it was her finger. No, it wasn't her finger. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe the other end. <laughs> but it just goes numb, right? Yeah. And I said, if you don't think raccoons or wild animals bite at what's holding it, just grab a critter by the, by the, by the paw yep. and hold on to it. I said, is the animal in discomfort? No. I said, but you better hold on to it tight because it's going to chew your hand all up, right? So I ex- explained to him, and this I've never had explained to me before I left Toronto where the animal's paw is now numb. They're not chewing to get out of the trap. They're oh. chewing at what's holding them. Yeah. And when they got no feeling in their their hand or foot, yep. then if they can still get at it, they'll they'll do they're just chewing for the sake of chewing. I, I learned that when I was when I first started trapping. I mean, I was just a kid. I was I wasn't even a teenager yet. But we knew that the colder it got, the more often we had to check our, our footholds. And the, and this was in the days, of course, before heatus and offset traps right. and all that. And the whole idea behind a rubber jawed trap and an offset trap is the fact that it it doesn't uh, uh, cut off the circulation to the paw, so th- they they don't their paw doesn't freeze or whatever. They remain right. feeling in it and they won't chew out. Exactly what it, you're talking about. Right. So. But we knew that if, if we were going to have an animal, like the, the, we were, you know, I mean, it was big money for kids and uh, we were just the, the, the greatest capitalists ever. So I had to be there. I didn't want to lose what I'd caught, <laughs> well, right? Well, and, and that was also one of the things we always heard, that the animals were pulling out, breaking their yeah. bones, stuff like that. So when I got into situations where people would question that, i say, I trap for the fur. I don't trap for the toenails. No. I don't trap for the paws. I don't trap for the legs. I don't trap. I trap for the fur. So if I'm using traps that are cutting things off or breaking things off, I'm actually going against what I'm trying to do. I had one teacher once say to me, um, and you can usually tell if you're into a group. She got up and she says, and this is going back in the late 80s. But like I used to just, once the fall came, that's all I did was was trap right she said the only reason you trap is for the money i said ma'am you're absolutely right yeah and she says what i said you're absolutely right i said but the only reason you teach is for the money she says well that's not true i teach because i love children i said so you'll come here tomorrow and start teaching for free yeah (laughs) there you go in injecting facts and reason right (laughs) yeah so she's (laughs) The principal actually came up to me afterwards. He says, I've never seen anybody put her in the replace like that before. But it's true, right? I yep. said, so I trap because I love it. I love the outdoors. I always have. Like, But you have an immense amount of respect for the animal. And yes. you, you want to make sure that, yes, you're taking its life, but you want to do it fast and quick. And I often say, like, when my time comes... You could stick my head in, the, in, in a in a thirty thirty Belial yeah. or whatever, and let, let's get it done with, right? right? And, and, and the thing is, and I try and tell people, no matter what you do, death you can't prettify, or I don't even know if that's a word. Beautify, beautify <laughs> death, no, right? It's an ugly process. And if you take an animal, that's if I grabbed an animal by the foot and held on to it for the first twenty minutes. The way I explain, they say, "Well, do they fight the traps?" I said, "Absolutely." I say, "You ever tie a puppy dog up first for the time, first yeah. time?" What do they do for the first two days? Oh yeah, it's they, they'll they'll fight the trap till they get t- or the the leash till they'll get, they get tired, right? Yep. They'll lay down, go to sleep. Then when they get up again, they'll fight that, and then eventually they'll give in. They're caught, and that's what wild animals do. Yeah. And you explain that to people, and that makes sense. The trouble is, the an- the animal rights groups take a ten second picture of a tr- of a 
animal in a trap. Yep. And they say, this is the norm. How yeah. would you like to be like this till you die? And that's not the truth. No, it's, it's not. It's not. And, and once again, I mean, they're, they're, they're clouding the issue. They're bringing in the, you know, the young and the Dan and they're, and they're bringing in yeah. the time of year and all that kind of stuff. But when we were doing it, and, and this was before, way before the, the, the certified traps and all that, it was just a matter of fact that we, we wanted yeah. to, to, to maximize. We had a coyote or a wolf or, or whatever. And, and the sad part of the story of that is the animal was used. Yep. Okay. Now, as fur prices are going down, what the animal rights people were more afraid of will happen more often because animals have to be took now when they're a nuisance, right? Yeah. So if there's a nuisance animal killing sheep or killing something, you can't wait for those young to get no big. Delta waterfowl has that, has that, that, pro, that I don't know about here, but in Alberta and on the prairies, they have a program where they will pay trappers to trap coyote and, and fox all summer long. Right. They're starting right because it's to, to protect right. ducks and that kind but, of stuff. But when fur prices were good, you didn't hear of. No. The, you heard of it. I, I don't want to say it never happened, but it didn't happen much. Now there's a whole industry around nuisance animal trapping. Yes. Right? Yeah. And, and I, I'm not dumping on that industry at all uh, whatsoever but when we can't sell the fur guys tend to take less like when when i i'm going back to the 80s i used to make 25 to 35 thousand dollars a year in trapping yeah okay yeah i used to scrape and a lot of not me personally i had a little bit of business going on the side around four to six thousand raccoons every year uh for other people really at five bucks a hit so that was on top of the fur market right yeah we don't have that market now at all i no. mean that market's if i do 50 raccoons for somebody else that's an unusual year now right because yeah. <laughs> when you got an eight dollar raccoon and you're going to give three bucks to the auction house and a buck to the <laughs> government right and you're going to give a five bucks to me to yeah. scrape it yeah yeah, yeah. The, 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 there's not as many people hunting, but now there's more and more raccoons coming in, especially in farming land where they're doing way more crop damage. So when they're doing the damage, the farmer just wants them out of there, period. He doesn't care what time of year it is. No, no. So if they let the natural harvest and, and it be worthwhile, you wouldn't see the issues. I'm not saying you'd see no issues, but I don't think you'd see the well, right now, I mean, coyote for forever. When I was when I was a kid, and that I mean, a coyote was a twenty five, thirty dollar animal, right? That was it. And now they're worth a hundred dollars more than that out well, west. You, you go out in southwestern Ontario where I live. When I first started to trap, if we caught a coyote, a coyote a year, that was really cool, right? Right. right. Fifty, sixty foxes, absolutely. But one, two, maybe, you know, two or three coyotes a, a year, max. Now, I mean, they're, they're out there prolific, oh, right? Yeah. And there's very few fox because... When coyotes coy eat fox. Yeah. <laughs> coyotes eat fox. Yeah. And now the farmers are saying, well, why are we seeing more and more uh, predation by coyotes? Well... Because there's more of them. Because <laughs> yeah. there's more of them and they're hungry. <laughs> and they don't... <laughs> well, you, you take in Alberta. I mean, we, we ship on average 40,000 coyotes a year out of Alberta to the auctions. Yeah. That's just to the two main auction houses. You can imagine what it would look like in our world if we didn't have trappers. Right. And the trappers are doing it for free. Right. It, it was like uh, um, Andy Hauser. Um, he used to be the head of the uh, fish and wildlife section of Ontario for the government. Mm -hmm. And we were at a dinner once, and this is going back years ago. And we talked about Northern Ontario, Southern Ontario, and people up north. Even when I got into trapping, ah, you're just a ringtailer. Like, we trap raccoons, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of them. And uh, so Andy Hauser, he says to me, he says, Bill, do you realize that more volume of fur and more dollar of fur comes out of Ontario from North Bay South as opposed to North Bay North? And if you look at that 
chunk of Ontario. It's very small compared to, you know, from North Bay all the way up to Kenora. How far would North Bay be from here? Probably about four hours north. So four, that's it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It. It. I. I don't know if you can envision a map of Ontario. A little bit. <laughs> but where it narrows right down, and yeah. Quebec's right here, and the lakes right here, and Ontario gets yeah. narrow. Yeah. That's from there down is basically. So you're still south of Canada then. <laughs> For the most part. I, they talk about farming doing stuff like that, right? And the farmers say, we can't compete with the Americans. And I'm looking, they're more north than we are. Right? Yeah. Most of Minnesota's north of you. Well, well, I have a bait and tackle shop in Windsor, Ontario, which is right under Detroit. Really? Yeah. I have fished the Detroit River many times. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Well, if you've ever been into Wally's Bait and Tackle, that's my bait and tackle shop. No kidding. Yes. Um, but Is that like under the Ambassador Bridge? Yeah. Okay, then I've been there. I have bought <laughs> I've bought a fishing license there. <laughs> but fr- that is the only point in Canada where you actually travel north to the U.S. Yeah, right? yeah, that's cool. That's a great fishery. Uh, yeah, oh, it's, there it's, used to be. I, I, it, I oh, it's it. getting better. The, we have a bit of a problem with, uh, in my opinion, of overpopulation of muskies. But uh, well, Lake Sinclair, we fished the tournament of Lake Sinclair one time, and. Uh, uh, I was out on the dumping grounds, and I, we were trolling across the tops of the weeds in mm-hmm. the dumping grounds. And on, on the Saturday, there was a couple of there was a musky tournament going off, and there was two bass tournaments, and I could not keep smallmouth bass and musky off of right. my lures, right? And, and, but the problem there is, is what happens when you protect the top end predator? Predator, yeah. Right? When uh, you don't, people don't think of uh, fish like we think of animals for whatever reason I don't know. But if you protect protected the the apex predator what's going to happen to the the feed oh it's 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 obvious what's going to happen i mean anybody anybody that that, that has seen it so So do you have then in in uh ontario are there registered trap lines in southern ontario it's private land oh so and then when you get up to the severn river and well if and that's just a rough line but not just before north bay Okay. About an hour this side of North Bay. You start getting into crown land. And wherever there's crown land, there's registered trap lines. And those are bought and sold? No, you can't. You can't buy and sell a trap line. You really? Can, you can buy and sell the improvements you've yeah, made to it. Sa- <laughs> sa- the same, same rules we have in Alberta, but yeah. It's the same girl, different dress. Yeah. <laughs> Right? Yeah. But you can't say you can buy and sell a trap line or a trap license, right? But, but you you, you end up having yeah. an exclusive right to that trap line. Yes. Yeah. yeah. To trapping there. Do you have a registered or are you a residential? I have I have I have a private land trapping license in southern Ontario. Mm-hmm. I have a registered line of my own just north of Huntsville, which is just south of North Bay. Okay. And I'm an O2 trapper. I don't know if you heard of a great big huge town called Scriber, Ontario. No. <laughs> you know where Nipigon is? Yes. Okay, well, if you come back an hour this way of Nipigon is a town called Scriber. Okay. And I trap on a guy's line up there. I haven't been up there for a year or two, but. Uh, oh, two, oh, two. So then that yeah. means that you're like a junior on the line? Or yeah. Or you're, you're his, his assistant? <laughs> yeah. Or? yeah. Yeah. You're. You're on there with his permission, and then whatever he tells you, you can do. If you're, if the O one says you're trapping with him, okay, then you're with him. Uh, Poogie had a huge trap line. He said, "This chunk's yours, and this chunk's mine, and we'll see each other at night." <laughs> so, so what's huge? Uh, like uh, two hundred and thirty uh, square miles, I think. His two hundred thirty. That's good. That that, that is where so, the one down here that I have is a lot smaller. Um, it might be. I don't even think it'd be a third of that. Right. Well, 230 would be about seven townships, huh? Yeah. I'd have to look on the map, but yeah. his goes 19. Yeah, he's over 19 miles up and 20, 20 miles. That's a good size. Yeah. What And what what's there for fur? In the northern one? Yes. Um, everything but raccoon. You got uh, Martin is a big one up there. Fisher, lynx, you get the odd bobcat, uh, beaver, um, uh, I, Martin, Fisher, lynx. I just 
Yeah, I mean weasels and stuff like that. But right. the, the main one up there, otter, uh, is another one. Um, the main one up there is is Martin. Is a good Martin line. Yeah. yeah, he has he and they have no quota, so they can manage their line. So if you yeah. have an abundance of quota, and I, I can tell you where that works. Quite a few years, Poogie will just let the line want it to grow, right? Because the every population goes yep like that. So when it goes down like that, he he backs off. One year he took nineteen, okay. Another year he's took over a hundred, right? Okay. Now my line, I have a quota which is more government regulated. So now, but you guys have a beaver quota as well, which right. means you have a minimum number you have right. to have to to keep your line. Right. So now this quota you're talking about for Martin is it a it's a maximum? It's, it's a maximum quota. Okay. But the only quota is. Uh, Poogie has is your beaver quota where he has to take, I believe it's 40 beaver. You got to take 75% of your quota without giving cause. Okay. So if you've had a disease go through or like, um, I got a quota of 40 on my line, but I'm right beside Algonquin park and this is where they've been protecting the wolves. Right. And you're getting scarce on beaver. (laughs) No, (laughs) And so the m and guy, when I took the line over, he says, you're going to have a hard time getting your beaver quota, right? So we're taking 10. The best year I did was 19, right? And I, I showed him the maps. I said, you, I, can, I can get 30 off of here because I had 75% of 40. I said, but you really want me annihilating the beaver on the line, right? right. But you'll go there in the summertime. There's a few beaver around and then. You go back in the fall when the beaver are worth something, and there's all kinds of scat up and down the roads. Yeah. It's all. Yeah, yeah. People don't understand how important the beaver is in the whole, all of the ecology. Yeah. I mean, not not just, the, like, I mean, people understand, of course, bear hunters understand, you know, how the bear love beaver, yeah. but, but wolves spend a lot of time eating beaver, yeah. you yeah. know, and, and people just don't, don't know that. I mean, there are so many beaver out there that people are unaware of. Right. So... My, my beaver quota is, they, they allow me less, but I have a Martin quota where Poogie has an open quota and he gets to manage his. I have a quota, a closed quota of 22. Okay. I caught my 22 Martin off a less than half the line in eight days. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So I, I'm trying to deal with the fur tech. And he says, well, we're looking at it. We're looking at it. Now, this is two years running, right? If you yeah. can get your limit, my first... Our first setting the first day last year was nine. So, you, and then because I got a quota uh, of, uh, of Fisher of 12, right? Right. Even though I get my quota of Martin, it's pretty hard to set a Fisher trap. I've tried putting little signs up, Martin, stay yeah. out, right? <laughs> Bloody things can't read. That's my problem. <laughs> so, 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 you almost have to stop trapping because. You do. Like you've hit I, your quota. I had I had that situation with the, the the current line that I have. My first few years, I I I was only allowed twenty two Fisher, and I would have the one year I had twenty two Fisher. I had seven Martin. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. so I'd, I'd I'd have to I'd have to to quit, pull it all, and and shut it down. There's so many things that go into in, into the, those populations, and a lot of people were telling me that well because I had so many Fisher that was why I didn't have Martin. But it, actually, it, it turns out as as I do more research, it's probably got more to do with with warm winters and less snow. That um, low snow years consecutively usually builds up your Fisher population. Whereas Martin, because they spend so much time under the snow, they like the the yeah. the, the big snowpack in that, and so then then they end up uh, reproducing a lot better. So what's what's happened since I, I took over that line? Well, we've had a whole bunch of ten foot wi- uh, snow winters, right? <laughs> I know. <laughs> they threw a special for me, <laughs> but but my Martin have, have gone like this, and my and my Fisher have have, right. have definitely stabilized. You know, it's pretty egotistical to think I have my my line's one hundred and forty four square miles, and you have a trap. You know, every every half mile or whatever it's egotistical to think that i'm i'm making a, a, an impact on that right on, on those those populations when you take a look at at, at the things like uh, your weather trends and all that that yeah. makes more sense to yeah. me you yeah. know e- even when they talk about fish populations i was at a seminar because i've been involved in the and, and i know this is trapping but the yeah. fish the uh, fellow from trenton university um one of the professors there he was doing a presentation on fish populations 
Right. And cold water fish, if it was a cold water when they were breeding, had a higher uh, rate of hatch. Really? And then the warm water fish, that what you'd consider your warm water fishery, right. had a better hatch when the water was warmer. Right. And he was standing there saying that all of these things you do to try and manage physically manage the fish populations with with uh, uh, s- limits and stuff like right. that right has so little impact on the overall population it gives you an appearance of managing he says but we're not managing anything he says the weather's control he says you can have a bad year and wipe out more fish and it, it's it, it's the ultimate virtue signal signaling and to me it angers me the most is because the average Average Joe outdoorsman agrees to go along with stuff because he wants, he is a conservationist. Right. As a trapper, a hunter, a fisherman or whatever, we are conservationists. We yeah. worry about the future of what, uh, of what we're doing and, and the animals. So when somebody says, this is what we need to do to improve stuff, we agree with it. And we believe that we're doing stuff. We've had uh, animals that have, uh, like the grizzly bear, um, uh, caribou, the goat, uh, like the mountain goat and, and bull trout now are are, uh, are protected as well in, in Alberta. All in each time, the outdoors people stood up and said, sure, we can get rid of that hunting season or whatever. It has not improved any of those populations because that wasn't what was what was pressuring the populations. But we, we took the hit for it. Yeah. Well, well, the reality of it is we take less than 5% of the total mortality in the outdoors. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. I've actually heard figures as low as, but I get in trouble when I say this, around 2%, right? So if we're taking or leaving plus or minus, say, 5%, right? Yep. You're, you're pretty bold in thinking, well, we can have an impact on the overall population by managing or, as I like to say, government's mismanagement of yeah. that 5%. They're really not managing the resource. They're managing people. That's exactly it, and that's that's the easiest thing to do because they yeah. can manage people with a keystroke yeah. on a computer, yeah. where they can't can't do that right. with with the animals. You know, when I when I was a tournament fisherman, we'd we'd look at an eight pound walleye, and she might throw a hundred thousand eggs, right? And if a thousand of them make them make it to spawn themselves, that's successful. That, that right. that's huge success. Okay, and we take a look at at everything that comes along that causes mortality along the way. When we're to look looking at our Martin or Fisher or or, or whatever, and uh, you know she has you know, so many young every year, and if 10% make it through to spawn, uh, to, to uh, mate the next yeah. ne- next year, that's successful. That's right. a healthy population. Yeah, I tell people, I don't try to, I don't try and make the populations go like, I try to take the high highs off and the yeah. low lows off. Yeah. That's the best, I think the best we can do, but as to be able to manage it, I mean, um, you, you can have a beaver population that you've been manage, managing for uh, 10 years, and Tullarima come through the the yeah, area absolutely and wipes them out yep. so then the, it, it pops back up but i still feel the guy on the line i i was doing a presentation in toronto for a standing committee once in not far from here up in i i've been extremely involved as folks from ontario would know in the organization okay. of, of the uh, the ontario fur managers and I was in Toronto and I was doing a standing presentation and it was on our species at risk law that was coming in. And one of the questions given to me by one of the politicians was, well, Mr. Davies, if I take your stand, what do I tell an environmentalist? And I said, well, Mr. Bizon, with all due respect, your questions your question in itself assumes that I'm not an environmentalist. Yeah. (laughs) I I, I said, I care more about that population. I said, my livelihood depends on a strong population. I said, do you think somebody who's got a concrete jungle down here in Toronto really has a good care for the population? I said, if that population's not there, whether it be minnows or whether it be uh, raccoons or, or whatever, as we started off by saying, one of the reasons I, I built my livelihood around what I love to do. I love to be in the outdoors, therefore I trap, right? right? But I do do it for the money as yeah. well. So I, I, 
I said to him, I said, if my livelihood's depending, because this was quite a few years ago, I said, if my livelihood depends on that population being good, I said, who do you think cares more about it? Exactly. Me or somebody who lives in downtown Toronto who doesn't even know what the critter looks like other than Walt Disney? Well, I mean, it's we, we, we have the most uh, honest free market example of that, and it's Africa. In Africa, if it pays, it stays. It's as simple as that. So you take a look in, in Kenya when, when they sh in 77, they, they shut down all, all hunting, right? right? There's no longer any hunting left. There are 80% less animals in the wild in Kenya today than there were then. And it's strictly because now the elephants are eating, eating your, your acre of beans. And that's what you're trying to live on for the year. Right. The lions are, are, are eating your goats. So those, all those animals are killed, poisoned, and shot. There are literally 80% less animals in Kenya <laughs> Than when there was hunting there, yeah. because the hunters paid for it. Right, and it's 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 as simple as, as that. You know, I'm I'm not going to catch the last I, Martin on my line because I I, I want to build. Well, and I've been at a lot of functions where true conservationists are there doing something. I have yet to be at those work days and see any of the Animal Alliance people there um, uh, helping plant trees or whatever. You know, or That's where right. you're restoring. Right. I, I, it's even with these beaver baffles, okay? I, Explain this. Beaver baffle is what they're pushing, some of the animal rights groups are pushing. And they basically take a chunk of the dam out, okay? Right. They put a tube in that goes way back into the pond. Oh, yeah. We, and then... We, the, we, we have 100 years of experience with that in oil patch they, in Alberta. They, it don't work. Oh, <laughs> it don't work. But they're selling them, right? Because... And one fella, I don't know if I should mention names, but his name was... Uh, um, uh, Mike Howie, um, he said, the reason beavers build a dam is because they can't stand the sound of running water. Exactly. I said, My, that is not why they build a dam. I said, he says, well, we put in these beaver baffles and they usually move out by next spring. I said, do you know why they're moved out by next spring, Mike? I said, I'd like to take a cam, right, and put down through the vent in a beaver house in the middle of winter when those beaver can no longer get out their deep hole to, to get to their feed bed because you've lowered their water in the dam. Yeah. I said, that's why they dam the water. They dam the water for the, for the winter feed bed, not because they can't stand the sound of running water. And he turns to me, he says, really? He says, I'll have to look that up. I said, how can you say you're a fur defender when you don't <laughs> even know how the critter lives? And, and I said, so... Be, the reason they're not there in the spring is, I said, you're starving them to death over the winter time. Exactly. Yeah. No. No. Like, so me trapping them is terrible. But if they're in their hut and they die, when 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 you said that, you know, he said that they they don't like the sound of running water. That's that's not true. It's current that they that they yeah. key on because you can we we we've done like I said in the oil patch in Alberta we've we've done all kinds of inve inventive things like that but even when you have a pure siphon suction tube or whatever they will go they'll find it and go block it off it's not it's not a sound of running right. water unless unless they they relate it to to the splashing over the other side of the dam but it's the fact that they find that right. current right. so that's why the beaver baffles don't work yeah. is because they do find the current and if if they can they will they will they will plug it or otherwise they starve to death like you say right I, I have, uh, you know, contracts with my oil companies on my trap line and that. And, and you know, I started getting phone calls now. And, they, and they, you know, we're having trouble with, with Beaver and that. And I said, well, well, it's too bad. We should have done this earlier or, or later or whatever. You should have been get a hold of me. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm not doing it right now. And they say, why? Well, I said, because there are kits in the, in, in yeah. the house. And I said, they can't swim for 30 days. You want me to go trap mom and let them starve to death? Yeah. And they look at me and I said, I, I got no problem killing them right. come October. No problem at all, but I says I, I'm not going to do it now. Right. You know, I says they, they have no value and and they and they're starving to death. But, well, but, but, I, I've never had an engineer say, <laughs> "Yeah, well, let's go kill them." After that, at that point, they're just like, <laughs> "Okay." <laughs> well, we have a little different problem though in southern Ontario, is we have farm drains like fields and fields, and there's farm drains, right? Yeah. And they'll build right to the top of the farm drain. The farmer can't uh, uh, work his field in the spring, right? Right. right. And then you have that. Uh, uh, where the ma and pa kick the young ones out a year and a half later, yeah. then they start building again. So down here, if we get a call now, we have to go in and get them because the guy can't get on his ground, right? Where when fur prices were good, I don't think I did three nuisance calls a year, okay? 
That's right. Yeah. But now that fur prices are down and people aren't trapping them, right? We get a lot of calls because we're in drainage. Like, the, like you say, they'll find a current, they plug it up. Well, and and that's that's what happened in Saskatchewan when they like in Saskatchewan, most of the of the the counties or rural management areas have a bounty on beaver, and they pay anywhere from twenty to thirty dollars a tail, and that's all you have to to to, to show up with. And they've actually removed beaver away from uh, fur managers or, or trappers altogether. Everybody and anybody can shoot them. Yeah, they had thirty eight thousand two years ago. The last numbers that I know, they had over thirty eight thousand tails turned in. Yeah. And all they do is cut the tail off and, and leave the rest. Well, and to me, to me, to, to, how do I put this? To me, it's a, an extreme disrespect or insult to the animal to make its worth garbage. I agree with you. Okay. When I used to be able to take the animal and, and use literally everything, at least then, but I, I was with this Mike Cowie guy. I, I don't know if you've heard the show Power in Politics. Yes. When they were doing the RCMP muskrat yes. thing, I, Solomon called me up and asked me if I'd debate Mike Cowie over the muskrat issue. And so we did. Just for, but, for everybody out there, it, it has to do with um, traditionally the, the, the RCMP Mountie uh, winter hats are made out of muskrat. And then they were going, there, there was a huge, uh, who was it? Took well, the after, animal rights. The groups. animal rights took after it and said that there was much better things to use than muskrat. Not true. And we did manage to win this one. Yeah. <laughs> yes. But in that debate, I said to him, I said, you know for a fact, in Holland, where they pride themselves in, that they're a fur-free country. Yeah. Right? Yeah. They trap over 400,000 muskrats yep. a year. Yep. And give them an aerial burial. Now, I've heard figures. I don't know if the figure's correct, and maybe I shouldn't quote it. But I've heard figures they pay 100 bucks a muskrat. Yeah, it's unbelievable. But they're a fur-free country. Because yep. they take it by the tail. <laughs> I call it an aerial burial. They yeah. throw it away. Yeah. Well, what respect is, is that? Like, why not have it? Why, if you're going to kill something, why not? Use it. Use it. Yeah. They do the same thing with the gray, gray goose over there, and it's forty or 50,000 gray goose that are, that are killed every year and then thrown in the garbage. That's a lot of, that's a lot of meat. Yeah. You know, that's, yeah. I mean, that's food. I mean, right. I mean, we have a lot of people in, in Canada that, that love eating muskrat, but, I mean, goose is traditional food <laughs> around, the, around the world, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you probably won't find muskrat. I didn't see it on the, uh, on the uh, menu at the restaurant last night. <laughs> so... What is your favorite animal to trap? Probably beaver. Yeah? Okay. And what's your favorite set? F my favorite set is a scent post set. They okay. bring them in through it. And the beaver is because you got one kick at the beggar. <laughs> They're pretty, they, they pick up pretty quick, don't they? Oh, I, I've talked to people, and they said, you got to trap smart beaver. I've seen it take me a month. And one guy says to me, he says, well, what do you do now? I said, well, now it's just personal. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, like, even with, with, with coyotes and, and fox, and, like, I like trapping Martin. I like, I, there's a bit of a challenge. There's not much challenge trapping Martin. You throw some bait in, yeah, throw a trap yeah. on, right? Fox and, uh, fox and coyotes, I'm pretty proficient at them. And even if they outsmart me the first day, I was trapping the Sarnia Airport because the coyotes were eating the, the leads off to the lights. <laughs> so they got me, you know, I was trapping it and I set six traps and we went to the first four and they're all upside down beside, you know, and I make mistakes. Nobody's perfect. Yeah. First one, I'm thinking, K okay, Davies, what'd you do? You dumb idiot. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the second one, I'm saying, yeah, are you this bright? <laughs> the third one was tipped upside down. I turned to the guy, I says, who was in here before me? And he goes kind of a shade of red. He says, well, We've had two people in here, and they weren't able to get them. <laughs> I said, well, why didn't you tell me? He says, well, what do you do now? He says, well, now, again, I use the same line. I said, ah, it's just a little more personal. And I outsmarted them. The next day, we had four. Right. Uh, had he told me, they'd had an issue. But you can usually do something. You can usually outsmart a canine. Yeah. But you get a beaver that's been well-educated, it's a challenge. <laughs>
Two things I think for that. First is that beaver lives in that pond and he knows that pond intimately. It's not like he travels. The canines do travel. Right. So you may have one dig you out one day and then the next guy's an idiot and you catch him. <laughs> but you, you, you think that you got personal in one, right? I tell myself this all the time. <laughs> I outsmarted him. In actual truth, the, the one who dug me out is, 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 is in gone. In the next county. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Exactly. So, to me, that's – but I, I think with the beaver, it's because that is his – That's you're in his wheelhouse. You're in yeah. his bedroom, right? Yeah, and so I, I enjoy that. And I, I, I think the most thing I enjoy most is, is just being outside. Like, uh, back in, a lot of people don't know, but back in, when I was 53, so that's uh, seven, eight, eight years ago, I went through some real bad anxiety stuff. I was president of the Canadian National Trappers. I was with the Ontario Fur Managers. We were trying to get a Canadian-wide organization going and traveling, and my doctor said, you got to remember you're 53, not 35. Well, one day I got up, I didn't want to go out my own back door. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was, it was a very weird thing. Yeah. And uh, actually what got me through it was my w- we just backed off a whole bunch of stuff. But the thing I kept doing was trapping. And instead of trapping under pressure, I just said, I'm going to go out. This is what I enjoy. I'm out in the outdoors, the fresh air in your face. And it, it, it passed. <laughs> but uh, Good, that, that's exactly, uh, um, yeah. So... What would you say is your biggest accomplishment in trapping to date? The thing you're most proud of? Probably the Ontario Fur Managers. Talk about that. Tell us about about the organization. The organization, the Ontario Trappers Association, I don't know if you know the whole history, it collapsed in the the late 80s. It was the auction house and... uh, you got to understand, I'm yeah. from Alberta. This, right. this is back east. Yeah. <laughs> you, yeah. you should talk about while spitting over your shoulder. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, a, a bunch of us got together, and we wanted to see an organization that wasn't tied to an auction house. And um, for the most part, I don't know if you know of or heard of Murray Monk. Yes. I think I'm he, friends with he, him on Facebook. He, okay. <laughs> he and I are very good friends. To say it was two people would be an absolute lie, okay? Um, but we had no money. We had nothing. And, uh, yeah. Sounds like when I got married. <laughs> <laughs> there was two of us. We had no money. We had nothing. <laughs> there, there was people all across Ontario, and they all did a, a lot of work, okay? But the main driving force behind North and South was Murray and I. And okay. um, I was the only one at that time with a computer. <laughs> in the group <laughs> so i did so you're you important <laughs> yeah, i was important i did all the membership lists i did the newsletters and i wrote most of the constitution for it and if you called them up today and asked who would you ch- call about the expert on the constitution i i stepped down a few years ago because i'd been at it for 25 years but we took it we took something that didn't exist we have membership of between six and 6,500 voluntary memberships of the province. We usually carry about 90 to 95% of all our trappers belong. And to me, to have an organization, um, to see the folks who have carried it on, uh, to sit, like, I step back, right? Mm -hmm. I step back and I decided, you know, I've been here long enough, uh, it's time to let the younger guys go. And I don't like to, you know, you sit there with your thumb on top, right? So I watched it and see some of the young guys sort of stepping in is probably one of the greatest senses of accomplishment because then I know trapping is going to go on. Exactly. And um, because of my background of what I said with the anti-trapping, I've always felt that a strong organization promoting trapping is the foundation as to what we're going to carry on with. And that's why we start, tried getting the CNTA up and going. And we did. Um, I hate to say this, but some of the, the directors out west, had they done their job? <laughs> <laughs> well, we had 500, just under 500 members in Ontario. Right. Uh, the East Coast had come on board, but they don't have many folks in there. Right. We had just under 1,000 memberships, but some of the 
western provinces had troubles getting double digit. Oh, I. But but we, in that we brought a we brought a magazine. We had a cross country magazine. Going. Right. We brought uh, trapping insurance across Canada, so that was an accomplishment. But um, it takes more than one person or two people. A fellow yep. by the name of uh, uh, Marshall Chris Christie. Uh, uh, out west or out east, he he was really in behind it. But I wish more people had been on board. Yeah, but it, it, it's difficult. I mean, when, when you're talking about, uh, sometimes I think that just the sheer geography of, of Canada yeah. is, is an yeah. issue. I know that even the, the difficulties we have within the uh, the Alberta Trappers Association, just the size of Alberta, yeah. you know, like to, to bring everybody together. But we did it in Ontario. Yeah. Okay. It, and Ontario's one of, if not the biggest trip across so i mean but to see the ontario fur managers going on the uh, executive director now robin and uh, robin horwath and uh, to see it carrying on and uh, it being a strong organization when you can get 90 95 percent of the people you want to represent voluntarily join your organization fe feeling that you have done that job for them and for them to carry on doing it from year to year to yep, year. Yeah, yeah. I look, I look at it, and uh, it's it's nice. <laughs> that is good. That is good. So, so, so we took it from zero members to over six thousand. That's very, very big success for. And you're you're a voice for trappers. Yes. And you you get a seat at the table. Oh, uh, absolutely. We, we we get a seat at the table quicker than a lot of organizations. We usually have a direct line to the minister's office. So what has, what, what has been the, the most successful tool in your toolbox on that? Just the numbers of your organization or you're loud or you're... Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I think knowledgeable, right? Um, a lot of times people get up and they, they'll speak on stuff. And like we, Robin, we've usually had very good people. Murray's great for speaking. Um, uh, and knowing what's happening and not just going there and making a fool of yourself. I, I think... I mean, we've done presentations to the city of Toronto. We've done them all over yeah. to the major cities. And I, I always say that the, the, the biggest secret weapon that Sandy and I have with our TV show is, is that we're just plain, ordinary, boring, normal people. And, <laughs> and people look at you and think, well... I don't look like a, like what I think a trapper right. is. But right. Once again, it's, you know... So, and just not allowing yourself to get caught up in the emotion and right. stick with the facts. And you, you also have to have people who can speak, okay? There's a lot of knowledgeable people, but as soon as they get speaking, they get a little tongue-tied. Right. If you, that's not one of my problems. No, I noticed that. <laughs> <laughs> it's not one of Murray's problems. It's not one of Robin's problems. And, I mean, John Fisher was a president for a while. Like, I've known a lot of the presidents and stuff. And, um, and having a board that backs you. Like, even when we tried to start up the CNTA, most of the founding money, or the money came from that, was from the Ontario Fur Managers. Right. And they were trying to put it in to recreate what we had across Canada, right? right. Because we feel the political, you, you, you can um, do whatever you want to do, but unless you're talking to the people uh, who don't know. Like, the Ontario Fur Managers now goes into the Toronto cottage show right okay yep um, we go into a sportsman show everybody loves us at the sportsman show yes right? yep but who do you reach nobody you're singing to the choir right that's, so, that's my favorite line because we probably have every every trapper with the, with, with the tv or internet is is a fan of our show yeah. but about 80 80 to 85 percent of our fans are trappers yeah like and so i'm not preaching to the choir i'm not even in the church anymore <laughs> <laughs> well, well, and then when we, like, we do the cottage show in Toronto, we do the cottage show in Ottawa, we've been going into more controversial settings, and when people see the facts, and I, I go back to what I started off with, I believe in the, the 10, 80, 10, or like I say, yep. some people say it's 20, 60, 20, but I, um, there's a group of people that feel you're never going to reach that 10% or that 20%, so Absolutely. We're, we're not trying to reach them. But there is that group in the middle who will listen to reason. 
you can't blame the anti-trappers for doing their job. Nope. Okay? Nope. But if they're out educating and you're sitting there with your finger up your nose. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, was a, that was a very non-trapper term. <laughs> I got thinking TV family. <laughs> but if you are, you can't blame the, the public for believing if they never see the other side. It's, I, know, I won't get into it, but the same thing with climate change. All you ever hear is one side of it. Yep. You know, yep. they never put Timothy Ball up to, to give an opposing view. So I don't believe it's the animal rights job to back off. No, no. I, I, I do believe it's our job to show the fallacies of what they do. My biggest problem is, is, and I've said this about a lot of things, the animal rights people are here, okay? And we go to negotiating, we try to compromise, right? So yes. we go to here. Yeah. And you say, oh, you take a breath of fresh air. Uh-uh. Because they're still here. Yep. So the next time you go to negotiating, the only way you can compromise is you got to move again. You got to move again, and, and I point that out at meetings. You you guys haven't moved. Yep. Okay. We have. Yep. Why aren't you moving? Okay. It's like I was at a meeting. It was a wildlife conflict group in Toronto. And Liz White. I mean, we're when I say friends, I <laughs> she's a nice lady. Okay, and <laughs> we, we shake hands, and she's a nice lady. But she, she doesn't know, right? So when she presents her side of things, and then we present our side of things, at least that way you, you get the other side out. One time we were in a meeting, and she was saying things like, well, we all agree on, uh, on uh, humane farming, right? Mm-hmm. And so even the farm groups in the meeting said, yes, I agree, yes, I agree, yes, I agree. They got to me. I said, no, I don't. She, the facilitator said, you don't agree with humane trapping or humane farming? I said, that's not the issue here. I said, her definition of humane. Exactly. And my definition of humane are two totally different definitions. I said, so if I agree to it, she's going to leave this meeting and go out and say, Bill Davies agrees with me. Exactly. When I don't. And I said, let me give you an example. And this is where I started off. I said, Liz, if I went up behind an animal very quietly and went, boo, it fell over dead and its skin fell off it, would that be acceptable? <laughs> right? And she said. <laughs> well, she didn't. <laughs> but the answer was loud and clear. Right. Like, they're not after, and, and you've got to understand this. There is no appeasing the anti-trappers. Well, it was a very, very, it's the same with anti-hunting. Like, when uh, I've 20 years of doing a hunting TV show as well, and everybody was saying, well, you can't show a second shot on TV. Like, if you needed to make a follow-up shot right. on an animal, you can't show that because that's just fodder for the antis. And I said, I'd always say, no, no, they're not against the second shot. They're against the, that I have the right for the first shot. That's right. what it's all about. Yes, exactly. So as much as I like the eights agreements, okay, yep. because it does give you a tool, I'm also a, I've given up far enough. Before the eights agreement, I could go into a school and I could take the traps I had because I believed in them, right? I believed yep. they were humane at the time, okay? And I was convincing people without the eights agreement that trapping was a humane thing because I knew how to come at it. Now, like I said before, it has made it good when you're at a city council and say, well, now our traps are certified, certified yeah. international standards, da, 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 da. That's hard for her to, to fight, to fight again. Yeah. Because they, they got to set what, <laughs> what, what the rules were going to be. Right. Which was one time that we, we were really stupid and got lucky. <laughs> but, but I, I maintain, and you will never know, I think we could have won the same battle without all of the same compromises. The U.S. has. Their, their, their fur gets shipped to, to our auctions all the time, and, and they, they don't have to abide by any of it. Right. You know? And, and, and my, my thing is, is that every time we go, we're the ones who are compromised. They haven't given an inch. I used to, I used to uh, this is back before, I mean, living in northern Alberta, most of the world has been passed as by until recently. But I can remember uh, Ted Nugent, 
and he would speak for the NRA and he'd be up there and he'd be yelling and he'd be defending the right to own an anti-aircraft gun. You know, and I'm thinking, <laughs> I'm thinking, geez, Ted, you know, maybe we don't need to own a, you know, a, a 25 <laughs> centimeter or millimeter uh, uh, anti-aircraft gun. And, I, and then I realized afterwards, as I got older and, and le learned a little bit more about life and that was you just don't ever start walking down the road. If you, if you don't, if you never take that first step, then, you know, they have to come to you. Right. And that's what, that's where he was at. And he was brilliant yeah. because the, the truth of it is, is, is that, you you know we've we've moved here now now yeah. we've we've compromised and that, right. and but they still haven't moved they're right. still against trapping period right you know so, and so then we got to move again and again and again right you know? yeah and I this conservative I sort of fall off the right hand side of conservative stuff oh I'm, I, I'm to the right of Genghis Khan <laughs> <laughs> and 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 I, and I feel the same way about that but I I really do feel if you've got something that is good and, and like I say you can't beautify death nope. okay. So they have that advantage. Give them that adva Give them that given. Okay. It was years ago, even with the FIC, and I've had some history with the FIC. Some good, some bad. But they were going at it from the a lot of the native, like rights to hunt, native mm -hmm. rights to hunt, mm -hmm. and and we're I won't say riding the back of the natives, but that was. I said we don't have to do that. Come down to farmland. In on southern Ontario, where we got four or five acres of corn stripped down, and let the people see that, right? Right. Show them the farms with the beaver dams across them, yeah. And they can't get at them, right? Uh, and 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 show them why we trap. Let's not just say it's one group. And I don't mind the natives' uh, rights, right? right? And I and I'll fight for their rights. I I think they have some rights that they should have. But I don't think you're going to win the trapping discussion with the antis that way. I think I think the best uh, the best thing that could ever happen are raccoons. Ra ra <laughs> raccoons in, in Toronto. <laughs> it, 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 it very well may be. But you see, then you're also appealing to that 80% or whatever that group is in the middle. Exactly. So we need to aim our, our advertisement at that 80%. One of the big things that we got on one of our banners of banners of the OFMF is uh, uh, we have uh, just up in Wawa a few years ago, the whole Trans Canada Highway was shut down because it was washed out. Mm -hmm. And it was washed out because they had a lot of rain up around Wawa. A few beaver dams in the top of the hills went out. Right. And I went up there that fall thinking, because I go up there moose hunting, uh, well, these must be big rivers that the bridge. No, the big rivers were all right. These were little f six foot round culverts or whatever. Right. That when the beaver dam let out, it couldn't handle the, the flow. So it took the highway out. Like it took out a parking lot of a dealership and a, a hotel. So you show that and some people say, oh, yeah. Or climate you, change. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the answer for everything today. <laughs> but, but you know what I'm saying? And, and somebody with a cottage says, oh, yeah, they, that's what happens, right? It, it was one, one of the things that sort of happened was the animal rights group got really bold, and they took on everybody. They took on the farming. Like, they were winning with the trapping, right, because nobody yeah. went trapping. Yeah. And then they took on the farming, and they took on, like, even my doctor, because, like, I go in – for a year of uh, shots and stuff, right? Yeah. And uh, for my rabies shots. And he, he said to me one time, he says, I never knew what you were talking about until they started lying about the medical industry. There you go. Yeah. Right? So, so now I can appeal to the doctors because these people who are lying about what you do, they're lying about what I do. Farming, whatever, right? Yep. They, they, they take an extreme example right and well, not even say first, some of it isn't set up first they come to to get your anti-aircraft gun <laughs> exactly <laughs> and then, then 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 nobody needs to have automatic rifles and then nobody needs to have semi-automatic rifles or right. black semi-automatic rifles. it's the same thing right. so the thing that they didn't do those they didn't kill trapping first before they made the next step onto the onto the next people, right. right had they they probably had they stuck with trapping i think it would have been a harder battle yeah i don't i don't disagree with you so I'm glad they did. I'm glad they got a little bolder. But it's still, 
but I think a lot has to do, like I teach a trapping course down here. And I tell guys, do, my, if I can go back, my dad used to say, son, you can be right, but you can also be dead right. Yeah. <laughs> I, I used to ride my bicycle from Toronto to Bracebridge and I complain about a truck driver and I say, but I had the right of way. Right? Yeah, yeah. And my dad say, son, you can be right, but you can also be dead right. <laughs> and it's the same thing with trapping. I, I've had chats with some guys and I've called some trappers some nasty names because I've had to go to in front of a council to defend what they did lawfully but was stupid. You know, and I have that too. And I mean, we run a lot of social media and I have to have, I, I have conversations with people. Yes, it happened. Yes. Sometimes the, the craziest stuff happens. And I, but I say, why would you want to show that? Right. You know, why would you want to, to shoot yourself yeah. in your foot? Like, like if there's a walking trail and you got permission from the trail to set the trap, don't set the trap where a guy's going to walk his dog. No. Right. No. Cause, cause that's going to be on social media. And, 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 and stuff like, yeah, don't, especially in Southern Ontario where you know you're going to be, it doesn't matter what you do to a dog, right? Yeah. If it's in a trap. Yep. There's, you may win the battle. Yep. Because you're there legally, but you've, you'll lose the war because people look at it and say, oh. My biggest argument with that is, you know, because every year invariably there's, there's a dog or a you know, caught in a snare or caught in a 330 yeah. in Alberta, whatever. And it's the end of the world. And whenever I'm, I'm asked to comment on it, I say, well, how many people were, or how many dogs were run over in Edmonton to, today? Yeah. And, they, and they look at you and they, yeah. I say, I say I'll, I'll, I'll bet you the somewhere between 10 and, and, and 100 dogs yeah. were killed on the highways today. So whose fault is that? Yeah. Well, the dog owner. Yeah, okay. So the dog is, is on my land and in my right. snare. Whose fault is it? Well, and, and, and I, I take that position. Yeah. But I also turn to the trappers and say, if there's something you can do. Absolutely. Do it on top of that. Yeah. I'll go and I'll, I'll stand for your, 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 your right to do it. But do it smart. Right? I have. Uh, we can sometimes be our own worst enemies. Oh, yeah. I've, I have, I have a, a guy who has a, a big feedlot. So he's got a dead pile, right? Yeah. And the, he has coyotes, and, and he's, he's close enough that he has wolves at certain times, too. However, he has neighbors right up next to him. His neighbors have dogs that roam. Yeah. And so I'll only do footholds, but in, in Alberta, that means that I have to check them every 24 right. hours. So there's not a lot of the winter that I can manage right. that. And so he's unhappy, but I say, you know, he says, well, if, if the, their dogs are on my place, you know, that's too yeah. bad. This is not, that's, that's really bad for both you and yeah. I. So, you know, I mean, the, the one lab there, I have caught like eight times in a foothold. <laughs> and, I, get you, and he sits there in his tail's wagon. He's so yeah. happy to see me. I let him out and I, and you I mean, check his foot's his, not hanging off. No, and no, there's nothing to go to wrong. I, I catch my, I catch my own dogs in footholds right. all the time. You know, so. I, I rub his foot and make sure everything's okay because I'm checking yeah. every 24 hours. There's, there's no damage, and away he goes. And then yeah. until the next time I get yeah. you, right? <laughs> people will say to me, well, does anything ever happen? And you know what I mean by that. <laughs> and I'll say, well, yeah, probably, once in a while. I said, but let me ask you this. The space shuttles. Uh-huh. <laughs> did they go up perfectly yeah. every time? Yeah, exactly. Well, no. The Hubble telescope. They sent it up. The most brilliant minds in the world. Did they make a mistake? Yeah, they did, because they had to go fix it, right? But is there intent to have a shuttle get a few miles off the Earth and blow up? No. So they do everything they can do to do it right, and then it falls under that one category where something happens. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, which you, but, but you say that to the public, and they say, Oh, yeah, I guess that's the same as your, your dogs on the road, right? Yep. There's an acceptable amount of mistakes. All you're doing is just bringing a little bit of rationale into the argument. Correct. Where, whereas all, if all they're seeing is some, some dog dead in a trap or a snare, well, that is, that is I mean, we all love dogs. Yeah. We all, yeah. we're, we, I mean, as trappers and that, we're, we're, we're animal lovers. I mean, when people yeah. have a hard time, you know, reconciling that. But, but it's the truth. But the the whole the whole thing is is, is the intent. Yeah. And there is well, no... I I people ask me if I go to a council meeting, especially like in Toronto or uh, Oshawa or something like that, big city. I say, have you ever caught a dog? Um, well, there's two different types of dogs I catch. 
well, what do you mean? I said, well, there's the legal dogs and there's the illegal dogs. I said, I've never caught a legal dog in my life. Yeah. Now, well, what do you mean by that? I said, I've just never caught a legal dog. I said, if your constituents are obeying the laws of Ontario, they don't have to worry about my, my traps. I said, but if you're letting your dog run at large and you're not supposed to, because you're supposed to have control of your dog at all times. Yes. You may have something to worry about, but I've never caught a legal dog in my life. That's a good way to put it. I like that. I like that because it puts the onus back on them. Right. Like, I mean, in today's world, it's always somebody else's fault, yeah. right? And at that, even though I need permission, right, and they don't have permission, in southern Ontario, I tell my course people, if when you're doing the practical sets and you don't do something to make your coon trap dog resistant, like a 220 or whatever, you'll fail a course. Okay. Because I expect you to use your head. It might be a legal trap. Yes. But, I, I mean, again, you get under that product category of crap happens, right? But I still believe it's up to us to take that three seconds at a set to try to make it not happen. Absolutely. You know what? I mean, I've, I've, I've uh, like I said, I've had a lot of, uh, a lot of dogs in, in footholds and I've had some of them standing there in the snares. I thank God they're not dead, you know. Yeah. I, I don't want to catch them. No. You know, like, I mean, the, the, I, I have uh, uh, a bait pile in, in the middle of, of a quarter section. So the, the, the neighbor's dog has traveled, you know, two miles to get there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's nothing legal about that dog, <laughs> right. but I'm I'm so happy that 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 he's he, he knows that what a leash is, and so yeah. when he got caught, he's standing there, even though he's standing in a power yeah. room. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's good that he's obedient with a, with, with a leash is on, but you know you can release him and he's gone because that's not what I want right. want to do. Yeah, right? so so we set to try not to. Does stuff happen? Well, if you're, you know, most car drivers. Have been in an accident yeah does that mean you're gonna yeah you know same same as your dog story so that that's sort of my approach to it and I, a little bit of common sense on the trapper side makes it a whole lot easier to stand in front of a city council oh that's good and good for you <coughs> i mean that's uh, that, that, that's fascinating that you must have some uh incredible stories about, uh, about <laughs> fights within council chambers <laughs> i think a lot of us do <laughs> <laughs> so where where to from here what, what's next? For me, um, I'm 60, 61. And uh, I'm, like, we s opened up some, a tanning business last year, so I'm tanning quite wow. a bit of fur. And uh, we're closing up the store in Windsor. And getting, I'm not retiring, but I want to spend more time on my trap line. There was, there was years when we started up the OFMF. Right. Um, where I would leave my house and set some traps, get in the house, answer the phone, go back out and unset the traps. And that's, that wasn't just my story. Right. It, the people who were dedicated to it. Part of my thing was, was uh, being as close as I am to Toronto, if proverbial crap ever hit the fan. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was usually one of the guys they got to go, not the only guy, but one of the guys they got to go to meet. So I'm, from here on in, I want to, I'm trying to spend more time on my trap line up north of Huntsville. I love the bush. I built my livelihood around what I love to do. Yes. Now I want, yeah. it's 60. I knew I'd get this old someday. I just didn't realize it would take this short a time to get here. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> um, yeah, I've been married 38 years in a, another couple of months. So we want to start. Yeah. Slowing things down. We never considered divorce. Murder has crossed our minds from time <laughs> to time, but never divorce. And uh, I mean, I, I married a wonderful lady, so uh, that's that's fortunate on my part. So, and we want to start slowing down, slowing down, but doing the stuff I like. I started tanning. Oh, I've always tanned, but I started doing it about three years ago. And I love working in the fur. Right. Okay. So now I'm working with everybody else's fur too. So so are you going in in this in a big way then? Uh, define big. <laughs> <laughs> what, no. What, what's the name of your fur tanning company? <laughs> oh, it's just under my Davies Enterprises company. Oh. But um, 
I'd like to be busy at it. Right. Three days of the week. Oh, okay. <laughs> I got gotcha. <laughs> my my cell phone. This is my cell phone. Oh, a flip phone. <laughs> okay. When I went in and so got it. In today's world, they, they, people would think you're a drug dealer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, when I went in and got it, which wasn't that terribly long ago, I said, I don't need hi fi, my fi, wi fi, or bi fi. I just need to make a phone call. And this normally doesn't come out of my truck. Because right. I got Bluetooth in my truck. And people say, well, I couldn't get a hold of you. I said, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. <laughs> that's a good thing. You're out of cell contact. No, this is in my truck. I, I mean, there's a time, right? If I can help out some younger people get in, if I can help out the OFMF uh, from a, because it's a great organization, um, and slow down and then start to... In, you know, 60, 61. I'm not saying it's the end of life. It, it might be the beginning. God, it better not but, because I'm 60. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, well, if you're, if you're there, you're the same boat as I am. You probably got more days behind the, than, the, than you do ahead. <laughs> nah, <laughs> <Right>? I never <laughs> think that way. <laughs> <laughs> I 13 grandkids. Uh, so um, they all got to get involved somehow. They yeah. got to have some old man to, <laughs> to show them the ropes, right? That's right. That's right. <laughs> so, yeah. and I, for me, one of the saddest days that ever came was when our daughter, she wasn't our youngest daughter, but our last daughter got married and my house was quiet. So now my favorite days are when the house is noisy again. I, right. I built a home. I didn't. And uh, I like it when it's noisy so the kids can come up and see. A lot of times, even up until three or four years ago, I was away a lot running, especially with the, when I was with, involved in the CNTA. Right. And now it's time to, I sit back and I can sort of enjoy the rewards of, I can look at it and say, I started it, but now it's not me. Right. 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 One guy can, or, and, it's, and it's, it's always kind of the sign of your, uh, of, uh, your legacy when it's worthwhile enough for somebody else to continue it. Yes. That's what I'm yeah. saying. Yeah. And, and you see these young guys who were the age I was when Murray and I, and there's Nick Nichols, uh, Tom Shepard, um, you know, if I try and think of the guys, I'm probably going, because we're going back 30 years, because yeah. it wasn't always the Ontario Fur Managers Federation, it was started off as the OFMF, OFMC, it was corporation, and then oh, okay. it changed names, but uh, the guys who, uh, I'm going to miss guys if I, if I start naming, but Nick Nichols, he's, he's, he's passed on, and Tommy Shepard was in, and um, Steve Ball was involved in it in the beginning. And now we can sit back and, like, quite a few years ago, I moose hunt up near Murray. And uh, he came down in his Kubota, and we're getting a picture when a guy he turns at me. He's sort of, we're not sentimental, but we sort of are. And he looks at me and says, the beginning of the OFMF, eh? <laughs> <laughs> so when we can sit back and look at it, that's you know, kind of cool. That's very cool. Um, very cool. And you knew, you know, I, I think that's going to be one of my. Your legacies. Yeah. Definitely. If not my, I don't want to say it's my legacy as in it's mine. It's, it's cool to, to say I was part, I was of, part of it. Of it. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. because that would be very unfair to a lot of people who did an awful lot of work. Yeah. No, but just to be part of it. I mean, yeah. that's, that, that, that's a, quite the accomplishment. Yeah. So that's, you know, fish, hunt. Trap, <laughs> the good life. Take my grand, <laughs> take my grandkids out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, if people want to get a hold of you for for your tanning, do you have a website? Yeah, it's uh, Wally's Bait, W A L L S B A I T dot com dot com. Yeah, awesome. Thank you, sir. It's been a pleasure. I, I have had a great time. Um, I, I know I've been remiss in, in in getting out to Ontario and and, and talking. There's many wonderful people out here to talk to. I don't like where I'm sitting. <laughs> I'm a lot more comfortable, I'm sure, on the, on the front door of your cabin or, yeah. or, uh, or, or at, at Wally's Bait. I've been yeah. there before. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.